Thank you very much for the invitation and thanks for this moment. Uh, we give God glory for uh, having been with us and guided us through everything. Uh, at this point in time, I just want to get to the message of the hour, which I titled, To God Be the Glory. And uh, in the message, To God Be the Glory, I think uh, when we reflect on uh, the songs we know, one of the most common songs that we would always sing is, uh, to God be the glory. And uh, we've just gone through it. And I just want us to reflect on it for the next few minutes. Uh, it's song number 341 in the Seventh-day Adventist hymnals. And then uh, we'll also reflect on a few texts. And uh, that will form our devotional thought for this evening. Let us pray as we get into the word. Precious Lord, we give glory, honor, and dominion now and forevermore unto your holy name. We are glad that you've been with us. We are glad that you've guided us and you've blessed us. And you've given us an opportunity to hear from you in this hour. We pray that you may open our hearts, open our minds, and let us hear you speak to us. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. To God be the glory. In the song, the songwriter says, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. And uh, most of the times when I reflect on this, uh, I, I, I see God is, uh, is being praised for the great things he has done. But what are the great things that he has done? Through this uh, quarter, our theme is on uh, the three angels' messages. And uh, under the three angels' messages, um, I would like us to reflect on a message that comes in the book of Revelation chapter 14. When you read Revelation 14 from uh, verses 6 and 7, and uh, I'll, I'll just focus on uh, specific points on Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Revelation 14, 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of the heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, let me reflect on this. And as we reflect on that, Review and Herald, October 13, 1904. Uh, the messenger to the remnant says, the 14th chapter of Revelation, is a chapter of the deepest interest. This scripture will soon be understood in all its bearings and the messages given to John the Revelator will be repeated with distinct utterance. When you look at letter 79 of 1900, it says Christ is coming the second time with power and salvation. To prepare human beings for this event, God has sent the first, the second, and the third angel messages. These angels represent those who receive the truth and with power open the gospel to the world. Now, you see, before Jesus comes, the world has to be ready for the coming Messiah. The world has to be ready for God to come. And so these messages, the three angels' messages, are actually preparatory messages for a coming Savior. We cannot say Jesus is coming and we don't prepare people for his coming. I, I, I read the story and I think you, you've come across the story that was being shared about um, the fire that broke up in a, in a theater and there was a clown who saw the fire. And the clown comes to tell people that, hey, there is fire and people who are applauding, they found that to be so much jokes. And when he amplified his voice, the applause also increased because people were finding it very hilarious. And, and, and that is the same thing that is happening in the planet Earth today, that everyone who is reminding the people that the world is coming to an end is being viewed more like somebody who is cracking a joke, a very expensive joke. For that reason, the three angels' messages need to be clearly understood. This is not just another message. This is a message that is warning people. In fact, it's more of an evacuation message, a message telling people that this 
world is going to come to an end. You need to be ready. Now, I, I, I don't focus on chapter 6 of Revelation 14, which says he had an everlasting gospel to preach to everyone, meaning this gospel has import to everyone. But I want to focus on verses 7, which says he said with a loud voice. And, and I wish I was able to amplify this better, but a loud voice simply means I want you to pay attention. A loud voice means the angel is not saying something that should pass you by. The angel is actually saying something that you need to take proper note of. He said with a loud voice, the first word, fear God. When I read that, I find it interesting. The first word of the three angels' messages is fear God. As though you had read from Matthew chapter 6 when it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The baseline, fear God. And fear God here referred to is reverential fear. In other words, it's not the fear of being scared. Fear, this is the fear of respect. This is the fear that then would make uh, Moses come and he has to remove his shoes for this is holy ground. This is the fear of understanding that whoever we are addressing is not just a common being. This is the God who created us. You, you, you see, when we're talking of fear over here, and, and I like to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 2, and, and, and captured this, uh, this text. In Deuteronomy 6, 2, when you read, the Bible says, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou, thy son, thy son's son, all the days of your life, that the days may be prolonged. This is the kind of fear that uh, shows that we are respecting. We are living knowing that there is a being who is in charge of life, and that is God. And so when we say fear God, Fear God simply means we are going to have God first in our mind. We are going to have God as the person we are reflecting on in our minds. We will seek God first before seeking any other thing. When we talk of fear God, and, and, and this really needs to come out clear, when we're talking of fear God, we must understand what does fearing God actually break down to be? Is, is, is it just uh, coming to church? And, and what does it really mean to fear God? It means we are going to have God in the first place in our thinking. It means we are going to renounce self-centeredness. We are going to renounce anything that is selfish. The biggest challenge that we have right now, and, and most of us who are listening to this, you know the greatest trouble that humanity is currently having is the fact that humanity is so self-centered. We live in a world that I am the center of focus. The I factor has become too much for us. And, and I think what better time to give the message fear God than a time when I is the one who is glorified? What better time to remind people to fear God than at a time when everyone is worried about being the first one who comes to mind. When you talk of somebody who is powerful, who comes to your mind? The first person to come to your mind. Is it God? Imagine, it's a human being. When I tell you, tell me of a powerful being you know. Too many of us will first think of a human being who is very powerful. Why is he powerful? He's the commander of a big army. Why is he powerful? He has a lot of money. But, but fear God means we are putting God first in our thoughts. But, but this, this message, this, this angel doubles two things in his everlasting gospel message. He says, fear God and give him glory. Give glory to him. Fear God and give glory to God. What does it mean to glorify God? And that's why I titled this, by the way, specifically, not even to fear God, to God be the glory. We need to give glory to God. I, if, if I was to end this, I would end this when it is clear to us, how can we fear God and give him glory? Because to God be the glory must not just be the title of a song. 
It must be a present reality in our lives that when I stand where I stand, when I sit where I sit, I can be able to glorify God. Manuscript 16 of 1890 would then capture it this way. To give glory to God is to reveal his character in our own. Giving glory to God is revealing God's character in our own character and thus to make him known. Now listen to this carefully. Giving God glory, and this is what we need to do. You see, when we started with the fear God, we fear God, and because we fear God, we're going to glorify him. Be because we fear God, because we put God first, we are going to manifest in our character, the character of God, and we will make people to know God because people will see God manifested in our character. Within the confines of the next uh, few minutes, I think I have about five, I want you to understand this clearly. To fear God is to glorify him. And how do we glorify God? We give him glory by revealing his character. To fear God is to have him first, but to glorify him is to have his character manifested or revealed in our own character. And thus, we make him known to others. In other words, when you glorify God, whoever meets you does not need to ask who is God. When you glorify God, whoever meets you should be able to know how God is. In fact, let, let, let me make this clearer. In manuscript 16 of 1890, it finishes the quote by saying, and in whatever way we make known the Father or the Son, we glorify God. Whatever way we make known God. To glorify God, let, let me make this practical. If, if, if I was to sit down and look at my WhatsApp status, am I glorifying God? If I was to sit down and look at uh, my words, what I tell people, how I talk to people, am I representing God's character? If, if I was to look at myself and, 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 and walk into my group of friends, do I represent to them God or do I represent this bad person? Do I represent this bad guy? Do I represent the devil to them or do I represent God? Let me make this more practical and easier to understand. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. A very wonderful read in Matthew chapter 5. If you read Matthew 5, a common one we like reading especially, uh, but, but, but we don't tie this one to Revelation. Today, let me just tie it to Revelation quickly. Matthew 5.14 says, ye are the light of the world. In other words, you're the ones giving the world light. You're the ones who are going to show the world what is light. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is built on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Now listen to this in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. When our lights shine before men, they see our good works. They glorify the father which is in heaven. Beloved, let me say this. We cannot glorify God until our character exemplified by our good works. We can have all the faith we want to talk about. But listen, to glorify God, there is an aspect of good works. That big faith you have must be manifest, must be seen in the good works that you produce. The child of God must be able to produce good works. As we always say, a mango tree is a mango tree because it produces mangoes. If it doesn't, if a mango tree produced watermelons, it will cease to be a mango tree. And that is a child of God. The child of God is a child of God because he manifests the character of God in his life. The moment he ceases to do that, then he's now glorifying God. And the Bible has said in, in verses 16, let your light shine. Now listen to this. Let, allow me to explain this. To glorify God is not difficult. To glorify God is not make your light shine. It is let the light shine. In other words, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in you is already light that is willing to shine. Do you know 
as a child of God, the fact that you've accepted God, God has given you capacity to produce good works. Now it is you who is going to refuse to produce the good works. That is why the Bible will say elsewhere that what more could I have done to my vineyard that have not done to it? Let your light shine. God has done everything. He has made the provision. Oh no. Ah, I'm an engineer by profession. An electrical engineer for that matter. And I appreciate electricity. I don't know how many of you appreciate electricity. But let me tell you, unless you press this switch on the wall, you can have all the electricity in the sockets, in everything. But unless you press the switch, you are not going to have light in the house right now. It's at night. You don't have light. But listen, press the switch. Let the light shine. That is what God is saying. That I have, when I came and died, I made provision. I actually connected you. When you're connected with Jesus, you're connected to the source of power. But listen, until you switch on the switch, let your light shine. Too many of us do not glorify God because we don't let the light shine. We cover the light and we, we magnify darkness. Please. Let your light shine. That, 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 that is a message of the hour. Just let the light shine. Please do not, do, do not walk into a dark room and you're complaining that there's no light. Please switch on the light. Children of God, let us go and switch on the light in our lives. Let the light shine. That men, beholding of your good works. Listen, when you allow the light that God has put in you to shine, men will see your good works and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. To God be the glory. Let me let me finish this. I have two minutes left. Let me let, let me just put a punchline to this. You know what? To God be the glory. Great things He has done. To glorify God does not need you to do a lot of things. It needs you to accept that God has already made the provision for your salvation. The first angel's message is a reminder. Before we go to Babylon falling, before we go to the mark of the beast, we must remind you that God has already placed the light. Please allow that light to shine so that God can be glorified. Because the first angel's message is about fearing God, putting him first in our lives, and then giving glory and, 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 and I think as we do subsequent studies, you'll understand we need to give him glory because we are living in judgment hour. We need to give him glory because we are living in dark times. These times are too dark. Let's, let's, let's allow our lights to shine. Men will see our good works. We are not saved by works. But listen, men cannot see your faith unless they see the works that you have in you. So let your light shine. And that will be glorifying the Father. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And, and, and I'd not plan to close with this one, but Ecclesiastes 12 must be read as we let the light shine. Ecclesiastes 12, and reading from verses 13, it says, Now let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret, whether it be good or evil. Listen, Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7 is paralleled by Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Fear God, fear God. Keep his commandments. When you keep his commandments, you glorify him. For this is the whole duty of mine. Letting your light shine is your entire duty. May God bless you. And when you look at verses 14, it says, For God shall bring every work, not every faith. And that is the role of good works. Let us have good works. Please, it is not being humbled by, by producing bad works. That is not being humbled. Humility is producing good works by allowing your light to shine. That men who see you may not glorify you. If you see people glorifying you at any point in time, you've got it wrong. When you let your light shine, people will glorify your father, which is in heaven. In fact, tomorrow when you walk into the office, let's, let's have a love of God in our hearts. Tomorrow when you go to our schools, when we go wherever we are interacting with human beings, let your light shine and let men say, thank God you've come into my life. Let men say, thank God we are glad that you are existing around here. To God, be the glory for your existence. Let people glorify your father, 
which is in heaven when they see what you do as a Seventh-day Adventist, as a child of God, as a Christian, as one who loves God. May God bless you. Let's go to the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, to God be the glory. May people glorify you in our lives when we allow you to shine greatly in our lives. The three angels' messages comes to us as a reminder that when God is preparing a world for his second coming, he wants some people who can allow the light in them to shine. That is why you've reminded us, first of all, to fear you, reverential fear, and then to give you glory by revealing your character in our character. God, I read the inspired writing and it says that Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of his character in his people. When the character of Christ will be perfectly reproduced in his children, then he will come and receive them as his own. God, please, create in us a clean heart, renew our right spirit within us, and God, help us that we may be able to let our light shine and men may glorify you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. amen. Lord bless you all. And Lord keep you Amen.